Good evening, friends. Happy to be here tonight again in the service of the Lord. After the fine shower today on the outside, I trust that God will give us the shower on the inside, a spiritual shower. We sing sometimes showers of blessings. That's what we need, isn't it? Great showers of blessings. It's usually kind of in line to give uh, blessings or to pass what we call the bouquets at the end of the services, but th in this case we won't have to do that. I never had the privilege of meeting personally any of the ministers and so forth of the association who let us have this uh, campgrounds for this uh, little occasion that we've had these two nights. But if any of the trustees or, the, or anyone connected with it, with this uh, uh, letting us have this place, we want to thank you, kind brother, with all of our hearts. And, and we'll start the prayer meeting. And remember, you love me if you do raise up your hands. <laughs> And I'll raise both mine up. I love you in Christ Jesus, undying love. Pray for me. Now the one who can open the Scripture is not a man, it's God. So may he open this blessed word as we read from St. Luke, the second chapter, for a subject and a text from another place. But in St. Luke 2... About 25, we read this. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same was just and devout. And he waited for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when they brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to your words, for my eyes have seen thy salvation in Romans 8 and the 14th verse for as many are led by the Spirit of God they are sons of God now we will use for our subject tonight um, expectation and we'll use for our text tonight leading of the Spirit of God. In the days of our text, it was of quite a time in Jerusalem. The Israelites, the Jewish people, had fallen away from their God and have went out and got formal and indifferent, claiming all the days of miracles were past. And they read what Joshua done. They read what Moses done. But they had got down because there had been an increase in science and in um, uh, the people. Education had become a predominant thing. It's too bad that those things has to substitute for the Holy Spirit. God have mercy. I believe I say this with reverence. I say this respect. And not using it for a crutch to support my ignorance. But I say that education has been one of the greatest curses that the religion of Jesus Christ has ever had. People substitute it for salvation. They think because the minister is very highly educated, speaks his words very well. What does God care about how you speak your words? Here some time ago in Fort Wayne, Indiana, I was amazed. It just comes to my mind now. I walk behind the pulpit for you that read this famous book, We the People, Just the Outstanding Things of the World, uh, takes place. They put it in this. On the religious article, they wrote something about my services at Fort Wayne. 
where God made a total blind girl to receive her sight. And a baby that had his feet clubbed in was made completely whole at the platform. I'd gotten real weak. They had taken me behind the stage where my friend Paul Rader, that went to glory many years ago, had wrote the famous song that I pack with me now, Only Believe. Standing in there, an educated man come in, very scholarly. From the sound of his talk, he must have taught Mr. Webster what to say. He said, Brother Branham, said, there's one thing wrong with your ministry. I said, well, it's kind, sir. I would like to know if there's anything wrong. I said, I don't mean for it to be. He said, that is your grammar. He said, oh, it's poorly. I said, yes, sir, that is right. I said, I, there was nine of us children, boys and one girl, ten children. My father died young. I said, I had to work and take care of ten children. And I said, I, I didn't get much education, just the seventh grade. He said, but Brother Branham, you're a man now. He said, that don't count now. He said, you could take a correspondence or something I, and check up on your grammar. He said, it's terrible. I said, yes, sir, I know that. I said, I'm sorry, but I said, after the Lord has ministered to me and I must go minister to him, the people crowd so much in the right today, 400 major cities in the United States is calling for services, sign papers and things for tens of thousands attend the meeting. And I said, how could I go, sir, uh, like that? Oh, he said, um, one thing that you made such a mistake on, said tonight you said, all the people coming past this pole pit, <laughs> pole pit, he said, Brother Branham, the congregation would appreciate you more if you said pulpit and not pole pit. Well, he kind of pulled my <laughs> ear a little hard, I guess. I said, My beloved brother, I differ with you. Them people don't care whether I say pole pit or pool pit. The thing they want me to do is preach the word and live what I'm talking about. I said, That's the main thing. So Christ doesn't come by education. Christ comes by a surrendered heart, believing Him. Now, education's fine, but it will never substitute salvation. It can't. And, but in them days, the people had got away. As soon as education comes in, the phenomenal leaves the church. Christ leaves. He can't stand it. They get so smart, they know more than He does. So the Scripture is not given by education. It's given by revelation. <laughs> not education. Revelation. So as soon as education takes your pulpit, many of you people in selecting your ministers to come to your pulpit, you select the, the, the young fellow who's just out of school, who's smart and witty, a social mixer. God don't want a mixer. He wants a separator. God wants something, at, see? And you choose him because a lot of times he's very smooth. He's kind. Like, God don't choose man like that. While when Samuel went up to choose uh, one out of David's boys, or not David, but out of Jesse's boys, David's father, they brought out the oldest son when they knowed he was going to take Saul's place. Great, big, fine-looking, curly-headed, seven-foot-tall. Why, Jess said, he'll look wonderful in his kingly robes and with his big crown sitting on his head. You see how man's ideas can get into it? And when he went forward, the prophet thought that may be the man. He carried the crucifix. When he went forth, the Holy Ghost said, I have refused him. The world had chosen him, but God refused him. The world looked on the outside. God was looking on the end. They brought the next big one, polished him up, perhaps combed his hair back, said, what a beautiful young man. Look how straight and sturdy he is. And we'll take him up and see what the Holy Spirit will say about him. I'm sure it'll be him. When they brought him up there, uh, the Samuel took the crucifix and went forth to anoint him because he's such a handsome, smart-looking fellow. And the Holy Spirit said, I have refused him. So he brought all of Jesse's sons, the five up, and the Holy Spirit said, I have refused them. So Samuel said, isn't there one more you have? 
He said, yes, I've got a little old ruddy, scrawny-looking fellow back there taking care of the sheep. Not very much about him. Go get him. And when they brought him up, a little old fellow with a sheepskin coat on, hair hanging down his neck, and probably he said his and Hank and Fetch and Carrie and Tote and no education, sheep stick in his hand. The Holy Ghost said, I chosen him, go anoint him. See what the difference what man wants and what God wants. Amen. It's a difference. Don't choose according to the outside. Choose the inside. Inside's eternal. Outside will perish. But when man begin to look on that, they choose their leaders. They choose their pastors and refuse the old-time preaching of the cross and the old-time salvation and altar call. When you do that, your church is gone. Amen. Right. Whether it's Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, or wherever it may be, it's gone. Israel had done that, chosen their kings until they got away from God. They forgot about the power God gave David, about Moses. It was something they was reading about. And they had got all broke up then and scattered about. What a perfect type it is of today. The same thing. Choosing the uh, mental uh, theology. Choosing man who can speak with great eloquent words while they're speaking in unknown tongues to half of their audience. That's right. A fellow not long ago was trying to discuss with me about divine healing, and I knew he didn't, couldn't stand it in the Scripture. And he began to use such big words, I said, I have not the gift of interpretation, so speak to me in English <laughs> that I might know what you're speaking about. So that is it. Now... And when they did, they got away, got away from God, got away from the supernatural. Oh, those things were past. But you know, God has never left Himself without a witness somewhere. It's got down sometime to one man. For instance, Noah, who found grace in the sight of God. It's got down many times to one man, but God has always had a witness that he could put his hands on and say, this is my servant. I tell him to go here and he goes. I tell him to do this and he'll do it regardless of what the church says or what the people says. He'll do it anyhow. God's had a witness. And in that day he had a witness. And one of them was our, our man tonight, Simeon, an old sage. Great long white beard, white flowing hair hanging down from under his turban. And he was spiritual. He believed in the phenomenal. He believed God. And one day while he was in prayer, God, by the Holy Spirit, revealed to him that he wasn't going to see death before he seen the Christ child. Amen. What a revelation. Amen. Now look, 4,000 years they had looked for Christ and then all teed up in education, smart in science and smart in psychology. Oh, they had it all under control, but was far away from the days of miracles. But God found one man he could talk to. Amen. God give us another. Old. Now, what do you think people said to that old man? One foot in the grave, as we call it today, 80-something years old, white beard, and going around testifying everywhere, saying, I'm not going to die until I see the Lord's Christ. Why? He had a right to believe it. It was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. That's it. Spiritual revealed truth. God said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Showed the gates of hell a big against it, but they can prevail. When he was revealed to him that Jesus was the Christ of the apostle. That's it. Notice, he believed God. Now, maybe the old fellow being a teacher, a great reputation. Smart man, educated. What do you think his fellow 
preachers thought about him. When he went around telling the people that he is going to see the Christ before he died. Why, they say it's no time for Christ. We'll never see it in this generation. It'll be many, 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 many hard tell hundreds of generations yet. But he said, oh, no. The Holy Spirit told me I was going to see it. You know what they said? The same thing they did to Abraham. The father Abraham, when he was a hundred years old, God told him when he was 75, he's going to have a baby by his wife, Sarah, which is 65 at the time, and 25 years they had waited for that baby, thanking God for him before the baby comes. That's it. You're the children of Abraham if you have that faith. See, you've got to have the faith of Abraham. God told Abraham, I called you from your land, and I'm going, he'd lived with Sarah since she was about 17. And all their young life, they'd lived together. And here she was, 65 years old, probably 30, 30 years past the menopause, as it is with ladies, far beyond any hopes of ever having a baby. But God said, you're going to have a baby by her. That's your wife. And Abraham believed God. No matter how impossible, if you'll excuse the expression, I suppose went out and bought up a bunch of bird eye, got the pins ready and everything, go to have the baby, making ready for it. When Sarah, the first months passed, how are you feeling, Sarah? No different, but praise God we're going to have the baby anyhow. No matter what the outside says, God had made the promise. Ten years passed. What about it? Well, no different, but bless God, we're going to have the baby anyhow. How do you know? God said so. Here he is a hundred years old. And Abraham, instead of getting weak, if God gives you a promise to his word tonight, and you, it don't happen in five minutes, well, you go away and say there's nothing to it. How can you be a son of daughter of Abraham? When God makes a promise to the son and daughter of Abraham, they believe God. And Abraham, as the Bible said, instead of getting weaker, he got stronger all the time, knowing it'd be more of a miracle. And he called those things which are as though they were not. He believed God. And Simeon perhaps said, Now, if my father Abraham... Believe God, because God gave him the promise, God promised me too. And I believe it. What do you think a doctor would say today if an old man was 100 years old and his wife 90 went out to the doctor's office and said, Doctor, I want you to make arrangements at the hospital for my wife's going to have a baby. Why, you know what they do to that man? They'd say he was crazy. That's the same thing they say to anybody who takes God at His Word. They say they're crazy when they're led by the Spirit. But sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will always bear witness of the Word being the truth. No matter what people say, the Word's right. You see it? Oh, I love the Word. Faith has to anchor on the Word, what God says. Now, if you'll notice, like I was talking to you last night, Jesus didn't claim to be a healer. Jesus only saw visions, he said. I can't do nothing till the Father shows me what to do. St. John 5, 19. Amen. Said I, when Philip come to him and got saved and went over and found Nathaniel, Way under a tree praying, several miles away, brought him back. Jesus stood and looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile standing out in the audience. Note what was wrong with him, all about him. He said, How'd you know me, Rabbi? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. That was Jesus. And those things that he did, he said, Shall you do also? I'm going away. But a little while I'll come back and be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. You'll see me and these signs and wonders 
to the end of the world. Amen. Don't be excited. Amen means so be it. <laughs> All right. You won't excite me to sing amen. It kind of hisses me a little bit. I know I'm talking to a many possum hunters. I had an old dog once would about take anything come along when you tree it but a skunk. And I'd get a skunk under the brush pile and the dog wouldn't go get it. The only thing I have to do is raise up the brush pile and pat him a little bit and say, sick him. You go get him. <laughs> the worst skunk I know is a devil. A little amen once in a while is sick him. <laughs> All right, led by the Spirit of God. Be expecting it. Simeon was expecting God to keep his word. Abraham was expecting God to keep his word. David was expecting God to keep his word when he met the giant. Samson was expecting God to keep his word when he laid his arms around the pole. Amen. Samson was expecting God to keep his word when he picked up a jawbone of a mule and beat down a thousand Philistines. The Hebrew children was expecting God to keep his word when he walked into the fiery furnace. Daniel was expecting God to keep his word when he went in among the lions. The woman that touched the hem of his garment was expecting God to keep his word. Amen. Martha was expecting God to keep his word when he said, I am the resurrection of life. Amen. Today, when you're trying to make Jesus just merely a man, oh, that makes my insides feel funny. Amen. Saying that Jesus is just a prophet, just a man. He was God himself. Amen. Amen. None other than the almighty Jehovah Amen. in veil and flesh. If it wasn't as the biggest faults the world ever had, a woman belonging to a certain church, a Christian science church, that said to me recently, she said, Reverend Branham, you put too much emphasis on Jesus being deity. I said, he was God. She said, now, Reverend Branham, she said, you know he was just a prophet. I said, no, he wasn't. He was God. She said, if I prove to you he wasn't divine, will you accept it? I said, how are you going to prove it? She said, by the Bible. I said, sure. Yes, sir. If the Bible said he wasn't divine, he wasn't. I believe the Bible. For there's no other foundation but this right here, the Bible. And she said, I'll prove it by the Bible that he wasn't divine. I said, all right. Where's your scripture? She said, St. John the 11th chapter. Well, I said, whereabouts in there do you see that said he wasn't divine? said, when he went to the grave of Lazarus, said, the Bible said he wept, said, that proves that he was a man. He wasn't divine or he couldn't weep. I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken that starved to death. I said, you haven't got a bit of room. I said, he was a man, but he was God also. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. I said when he stood for the grave, certainly he wept like a man. But when he looked out there and straightened his little body up, not much to look upon, the Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. But when he looked out there to the grave, a man had been dead and in the grave and the skin worms crawling in and out of him. He said, Lazarus! Come forth. And a man that had been dead for four days and his soul a four-day journey out somewhere come to life and stood on his feet again. That was more than a man. Yes, sir. Corruption knew its master. Life knew its maker. And a man that was rotten in the grave come back as a normal living man and set in peace with mankind. That was more than a man. That was God in a man. Surely he come down off the mountain one night, one morning rather, hungry, looking around over a fig tree to find something to eat. He was hungered. He was a man when he was hungered. 
But when he took five biscuits and two little fishes and fed five thousand, that was more than a man. That was God. A God man. Truly. He was a man out there that night when he was so tired and the virtue going out of him from healing the sick and so forth through the day and God the Father speaking to him with visions and so forth. He is out on a troubled sea. The little ship tossed about like a bottle stopper. Ten thousand devils of the sea swore they had drowned him that night. And he was so tired he was laying in the stern of the boat. Even the waves didn't wake him up. He was a man laying there tired. But when he put his foot upon the brail of the boat, looked up and said, Peace, be still. And the wind and the waves obeyed him. That was more than a man. That was a ruler of heavens and earth speaking to the old man's lips. Truly, he died on the cross screaming like a man. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He died like a man, but on the third day he rose up proving himself. No wonder the poet said, Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, someday he's coming, oh glorious day. No wonder it's thrilled the heart of poets and authors and prophets through the years. And any man that ever mounted to a hill of beans believed on him as Savior. Eddie Pruitt, when he was all persecuted by the outside world, I stood recently by his grave. Him and Kepper, who wrote, There is the fountain filled with blood. When Eddie Pruitt laid back in his little den room one day, and they couldn't sell his songs. They said he was crazy. But God spoke to him, and he grabbed the pen, and he wrote the inauguration song of the second coming of Jesus. He said, Oh, Hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord. Oh, my. Look at that. Expectations. If you're expecting it, you will receive it. You usually get what you expect to get. If you come to the meeting tonight expecting to find something to criticize the meeting, the devil will show you. He'll see that you get satisfied. You get what you expect. If you come to get a blessing, God will see that you get it. Amen. If you come to get saved, God will see you get it. Amen. If you come to get healed, be expected to get healed. God will see that you do it. It's whatever you're expecting. Now, in the days of Simeon, they didn't have telegrams and so forth like they do today. And they didn't have the televisions and the radios and so forth of modern sciences we had. The message was from lip to ear. And I, you know, only those who are expecting usually get what they're looking for. Notice, there were some magis way back over in the eastern country. India, perhaps. Magis, not long ago, about a year ago, passing through the streets of India, seeing the old Magi, still in their same custom, sitting there watching the stars. These Magi, they believed that he was coming. And three of them saw the star and followed it from the east to the west. The scripture said, we have seen his star in the east. Yes, they were in the east and they saw it in the west. For the Orients lay east of the, of the Palestine. So they had to be in the east to see a star in the west. We have seen a star in the east, and we have come west to worship him. Amen. Notice, that star passed over every observatory, and that's the only way they could tell time then, was by the observatory. They kept time by the stars. Watchmen, what of the night? You remember? The prophet. That star, do you believe it was a star? Yes. The Bible said it was. Yes. And it passed over every observatory with orthodox believers looking up at the sky, watching time. They stayed up on top of the building, up on the wall, and they watched the stars. And some weary man come out at night and say, Watchman, what about it? 
It's so many hours, the fourth watch, the fifth watch, so many hours to daylight. And they watched the stars in every city. And not one of them ever saw it. And the Magi's followed it all the way from India, from into Palestine. Why didn't they see it? The reason people can't see the glorious things of God today, they're not looking for it. That's the reason. It's only given to those who are looking for it. Those Magi's have watched Balaam's prophecy. When he said there will be a star rise out of Jacob. And they knew it, the way things are shaping up. It was time for it to happen. And you can tell. Hey, man, here it is. Listen. You can tell we're at the end of the road. Atomic bombs, cobalt, hydrogens. The nations are trembling, fussing. The great enemy hanging yonder was jet planes that could blow this nation to pieces, yes, the whole world, in five minutes' time. Everybody's nervous. Like a little lamb out in the field of eating. And he seems to become nervous. What's the matter? You who are up high and look down. Look at there. It's a lion crutching after him. He doesn't see the lion, but there's something telling him. That's the way it is today with human beings. They're nervous. They're upset. They don't know what to do. What's the matter? The enemy's crunching. He's ready to spring. The end's here. Anybody with right kind of mental thinking knows that something's wrong. The Magi saw that and they said, there'll be a star. I'll be watching for her. They saw it. What did Jesus say would take place just about this time? And I will restore to the people all the glory of the farmer, and I'll pour out upon them the farmer and the light of rain. And the signs and wonders that was in the first church will be in the second church at the last day. Here's your sign. He's appearing on the earth. Signs and wonders, the same thing that he did is sure again. Your spirit moving amongst the people. The prophet said it will be light in the evening. It will be a day which was not day or night. It was gloomy. Back at the early church when they had signs and wonders of Jesus among them, they saw visions and healed the sick and so forth. Great signs and wonders of the Bible. The light become dim. It went on until they come through the dark ages. After the dark age come Luther. After Luther come Wesley. After Wesley come Calvin. After Calvin come, oh, just on and on. What is it? They had enough light to know that Jesus saved. It was a gloomy day. But the Bible said, in the evening time, it shall be light. The sun was rising in the east on the eastern people, the Jews and the eastern people. And civilization travels with the sun. And now it's in the last days. We've traveled to the west coast. The next thing is the east again. And when the sun is going down, it should shine out in all of her glory. The Holy Spirit's here. Have you been expecting him? If you are, you'll surely see his leadings. Simeon, he was expecting Jesus. And if God has made you a promise, God's under obligation to keep that promise. And God will never make a promise that he can't keep. So, when Simeon, perhaps that day when Jesus was born, the wise man came. They was expecting it. The poor shepherds out on the hillside, he never went to the clergyman. They wasn't expecting him. But old shepherds, poor peasants out on the hillside, the angels came down and said, Today in the city of David, there's born Christ the Lord. They went and found it even so. Messages didn't get scattered around. Let's take it, it's Monday morning in the temple. Many babies are born, and two million people, as Jews was then, many babies are born. Every male child must be brought to the 
to the temple after eight days and be circumcised. And the mother had to offer a lamb, or if she was poor, she offered two turtle doves for the purification of her own self and for the circumcision of the baby. It was a law. Let's say it's Monday morning. Hundreds of babies is born every day. And it's Monday morning, busy around the temple. Caiaphas is sitting back with his fan. It's a judge, knowing nothing about it. The priests are on their regular routine, arguing what kind of buttons they should have on their clothes or something like that. And there's an old man by the name of Simeon sitting in the prayer room, reading Isaiah, perhaps. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. For he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, and with his stripes we were healed. Oh, he says, God. Oh, God. And you give me the wonderful promise that I'll see him. Yes. About that time, if God made you a promise, God will keep his promise. Amen. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, Simeon, Rise up. What for, Lord? No, no. Man of God, don't question God. When he says rise up, he raises up. Amen. He got up. There ain't no business of what he's going to do. Just follow him. Amen. Don't wait. Say, now, if I went to the altar, Miss Jones, what would she say? What would the pastor say? What would this say? Don't make any difference what they say. Do what the Holy Spirit says. Amen. Move. Simeon raised up in the temple. He looked around. The Bible said, When the deep to David, when the deep calleth to the deep. Do you believe in divine healing? Say amen. amen. Well, that's the reason there is a divine healing. Because you believe it. There's something in you. When we first come, our fathers came to Kentucky, they fought the Indians. And they found the Indians, when they would die, they'd go down here at the Ohio River and around in the Green River and Cumberland River here and put their dead in a canoe and put some car and a bow and arrow and put, push him out in the river. They said he's going to the happy hunting ground. The Indian didn't know about God. The only thing, there was something in him that told him there was a God. The hot and tots of Africa went in there, the man didn't know right or left hand, but he worshipped an image. He knew there was a God, something in him. He's a human being. He's got a soul. Yes, that's right. Tells him there's a God. Yes, Notice, quickly. I'll have to hurry and close. Time is getting away so swiftly. Notice. When the deep calleth to the deep, David said at the noise of thy water spouts. If there's something in here calling for something... There's got to be something out there to respond to that call. In other words, before there was a fin on a fish's back, there had to be a water for him to swim in or he wouldn't have no fin. Before there was a tree to grow in the earth, there had to be an earth first or there wouldn't be no tree to grow in the earth. If there's something in here calling for something, there's got to be something out there to respond to it. As not long ago, I read in a paper, I've quoted it many times, where a little boy eat the racers off a of pencil. He eat the pedal off of a bicycle. And they tuck him down to the doctor and examine him at the laboratory, or the clinic, rather. And they found out his body needed sulfur. He found sulfur in the pedal of the bicycle or in the rubber. Sulfur is in rubber. See, there was something in here calling for sulfur. And if there's anything calling for sulfur, there's got to be a sulfur to respond to that call or there'd never be a call. And if you're seeking divine healing from God, there's got to be a fountain open somewhere. Amen. The Indian was seeking God. There's got to be a God to respond to it. If you're seeking the Holy Spirit, there's got to be a Holy Spirit to respond to that seeking. If there's no deep to respond, there's no deep to call. Why'd you come here tonight? Because you believe that there is somewhere. And as sure as you believe it, there's a fountain open. That's why the Holy Spirit brought you here. Simeon believed that he was going to see the Christ. 
and he was sitting in the temple, it was God's business to see that he found that place, just like it's God's business to see that you got here tonight. Led, expecting, and he got up, went walking out through the building. Notice quickly, give me your attention, walking through the building. And the first thing you know, he hits this line of mothers. He looks standing down there. There was all the rich women with their little babies, with fine needlework, their little pink and, and blue blankets and so forth, each one holding a lamb, pretty little things. And way down the line, I see a little virgin about 18 years old. She's got a black name behind her because they said this baby belonged to Joseph and the baby was born out of wedlock. But in that little mother's heart, she knew who that baby belonged to. Amen. It didn't have fine needlework. No. It had swaddling's cloth. Yes. That's what you take off the back of a yoke of an ox when he's plowing. The king of glory. No needlework. Swaddling's cloth to wrap him in. The mother standing, her little veil over her face, looking down to the little baby. And the other women keeping their distance. We'll have nothing to do with her. She is an outcast, an outcast. In her heart, she knew who that baby belonged to. The Holy Ghost said it shall be called the Son of God. Amen. How? It wasn't to reason. It was to believe. And there, they kept their distance. But here comes the prophet, the one who believed in supernatural. He was the supernatural. Walking down through there, the old sage, the tears running down his cheeks. As he walked, stopped right in front of that little old mother, reached over and tucked that baby out of her arms. He looked at it, the tears running down his cheeks. He said, Lord, <laughs> let thy servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen your salvation. Amen. There you are, led by the Spirit. Oh, my, expecting it and being led by the Spirit to what you're expecting. In the temple, the same day was an old blind prophetess by the name of Anne. She didn't leave the temple. She prayed day and night. She was blind in her eyes, but she could see a lot farther than people could with their eyes. She blind. She was waiting for the consolation of Israel knowing that Christ would come someday and the Holy Spirit struck her. She stood up on her feet. And here come that old prophetess, blind, moving by the Holy Ghost, moving through the temple, around the critic, until she come and stood in front of him, the Holy Ghost leading her to Christ, raised up and prophesied, and bless Mary and the baby, led of the Spirit, expecting it, believing it. Some time ago, coming from Dallas, Texas, a storm came up and blowed my plane. We landed at Memphis, Tennessee. I'll never forget it. They sent me up to that great hotel there called Peabody. I could never stay in a hotel like that with my own money. I don't have that type of money. But the... The airlines sent me up there, the TWA. And then when I was up there that night, I prayed that night the next morning. Do you believe that we are led by the Spirit of God? Amen. I wish I had time to tell you many things. On with this. At this time, it was very striking. Next morning, I had some letters. I was going to the post office to mail them. And I started down the street. They called me and said, be ready to catch the plane at 8 o'clock. The limousine will pick you up at 7.30. I said, thank you, sir. I said, now let's see, it's 6.30. I got time to go down there to the post office. And I went out to mail the letters. I was going down the street singing. Well, first thing you know, the Holy Spirit said, stop. I thought, what's wrong? I thought maybe I just thought I heard that. Went a little farther and something checked me. I said, stop a minute. I looked, there's a big police standing on the corner. So I stepped back up like I was looking at some fishing reels. And the Holy Spirit said, turn and go the other way. 
I don't know no more than just to do what he tells me to do, and I hope I never know any more. I turned and started back past for the hotel, went on and on and on. I looked at my watch. It was 8.30. I got come over into the colored district. I didn't know where I was going. Just being led. I didn't know. Just kept going. I've had it to happen dozens of times, just hundreds of times. I was just being led. I thought, Lord, why do you want me way down here around the river in these little colored haunts where the colored people live? That's nothing to you. Follow thou me. Amen. I just kept on walking. The first thing you know, I looked leaning across a gate, and I was going along there singing that little song. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Sing it to myself. And I looked across the gate, and there was a typical old Aunt Jemima with a man's shirt tied around her head, a little whitewashed cabin of a thing sitting there. And there was a, a plow point hanging on the gate for a weight to pull it back. And she was hanging out there looking over there. I see her about hundred yards away, and I quit singing, just went on down the street. When I passed by, she started smiling, looking at me, tears running down her big, fat cheeks. She said, good morning, Parson. And I turned around, I said, good morning, Auntie. I said, how'd you know I was a Parson? She said, Parson, did you ever read in the Bible about the Shunammite woman who couldn't have a baby, and she told the Lord that she was blessed and and uh, Elijah told her that she's going to have a baby. She had it, and then the baby died. I said, yes, I remember that. She said, I was that kind of woman. I couldn't have no baby. And I told the Lord I'd raise the baby and said to suit for him. And she said, the Lord give me and my husband a baby. And she said, Parson, she said, uh, the baby, my boy, when he got to be a man, he went out and done what was wrong. And said, I couldn't help it, Parson. Said, I washed over the washboard. Said, to try to raise him right in church. But said, he backslid. And he went away from God and he got with the wrong crowd. And said, Parson, said, he got a bad disease, syphilitic, dying with a venereal disease. And said, and he's laying in here dying. And she said, hold a doctor man was here yesterday. And said, he's been unconscious since yesterday morning. And said to me, he'll never gain conscious no more. Said his heart, blood is coming back to his heart. It's eat him up. And there's too late to do anything for him. He's done eat holes in him. And she said, Parson, I just couldn't see my baby die without knowing the Lord. He said, I prayed all night. He said, I kept saying, Lord, I as the same woman was Elijah. He said, I kept praying. And said, I fell asleep. And she said, I dreamed I seen a man coming with a lead-colored suit on, wearing a tan hat. Said, that was you, Parson. Amen. She said, the Lord told me it's 3 o'clock this morning to come stand at this gate and wait for you. Said, I've been here ever since. <laughs> I patted on her shoulder, still wet with the dew. I thought, Lord, here it is. She said, won't you come in? I've been in four king's palaces. I've been in some of the best homes in the nation around the world. I never was any more welcome than I was in that humble little home that morning. I walked in the door. There was no pinup girls on the wall. There's a little sign up over the door, God bless our home. I looked at an old chunk stove sitting in the floor, a little iron poster bed sitting in the corner, and a great, big, about 180-pound, dark boy laying there with a sheet in his hand. Going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She said, you see, Parson, said he's been unconscious now. This is the second day. And said he thinks he's out on a big sea and he's lost. And just then he said, Mammy, it's dark. It's dark. I just don't know where I'm going. She said, oh, Parson, said, do you hear that? Said, oh, I can't stand to see my baby die like that and reached down and kissed him on his forehead. I thought, oh, God, no matter what he done, how much sin he was in, he's still Mammy's baby. She couldn't forget him. That's her baby. And I thought, God, if that mother can't forget her baby, yet you said a mother may forget her suckling child, but I can't forget you. 
you're engraved on the palms of my hand. And I thought, oh God, that poor woman. And she was crying. And I said, Auntie, my name is Branham. Did you ever hear of me? She said, no, sir. Parson Branham, I never heard of you. And I said, my ministry is praying for the sick. She said, I was glad to know that. I said, Annie, would you kneel with me for prayer? She said, yes, Parson. I said, lead, Annie. And she knelt down there. And, oh, brother, you thought she might have been a washwoman. But let me tell you, when that old woman started praying, you could feel the power of God moving in the room. She said, dear Lord, her baby laying there dying but not a bit disturbed. She said, dear Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name such a prayer. I stood there and took the sheet and wiped my eyes with it. When she got through praying, I said, Lord, you have sent your parson. Now, Lord, let me hear my baby say that he's saved before he goes. I looked at her. I thought, bless your old heart. I said, now I'll pray, Auntie. I said, Heavenly Father, my plane's been gone nearly two hours. But you said, walk. That's all I know to do. I was expecting you to do something. Now, I can't do nothing hard but talk to you. I just felt his feet is cold and sticky. Death was on him. I said, all I can do is talk to you, Lord. But will you have mercy on this boy? Save him, dear God, and heal his body for the sake of this poor old mother. And when I got through praying, he said, Mama, she said, Yes, honey. Says it's getting light in the room. <laughs> Five minutes from there, he was sitting on the side of the bed shaking hands with me. I jumped out and grabbed the plane and went to the station. The plane was still waiting, <laughs> just making its last call. God, through grace, Amen. stopped that airplane Amen. and kept me there because of a poor, ignorant colored woman. Yeah. Think of grace. Measureless and boundless is the grace of our God. Grounded an airplane and held it sitting there for the prayer of a poor washwoman. Oh, my. About a year ago, I was passing through the train. Well, the train stopped. If you ever went to Memphis, how the train pulls up, I started down to get me a sandwich. It's too high on the train. So I went down to get me a hamburger. And I got out of the plane, uh, train, started walking down. I heard a red cap say, Hello, that Possum Brown. I looked around. I said, How do you do, sir? said, You don't know me, do you? I said, I don't believe it. He said, you remember that morning that the Holy Ghost led you up to my mammy's house? I said, you're not the boy. I said, yeah, Parson. said, I'm healed and I'm a Christian now. Amen. Oh, my. A few days ago, the student brothers here is at my house. And your beloved boy here, Brother Banks Woods and his wife, Living no our neighbors to me. Looking at the lane of woods down about 150 yards, coming up the lane and turned into my gate, passing four other houses, was a possum at 10 o'clock in the day. Now, Hunter, brother, you know possums don't travel in daytime. They travel at night. It started in, I thought it may have rabies. So I went out and took a yard rake to lay over it, and she growled at me. I, it had a broken leg. The dogs must have chewed it or a car hit it. And it was all green flies and maggots in its ears. And it was in a terrible shape. I thought that's the reason it growled. Usually they just fall over. But I happened to notice and she had nine little naked babies. I said to Brother Leo and Jean that's here somewhere, I said, boys, come here. The other day a woman in Jeffersonville, beautiful woman, gave birth to a baby and went out and wrapped it in a blanket and smothered it to death and taken it out on the bridge and dropped it in the water. I said, this possum is more of a mother than that woman is. Right. Oh, how low can human beings get? 
and the possum wouldn't stop for me. She made her way right to my steps and fell over. Mrs. Woods and Mr. Woods, who's here now, come up and look. Mrs. Woods has had a lot of experience in Mr. Woods around sheep and things. Very lovely people. And Mrs. Woods said to me, she said, Brother Branham, the only decent thing to do with it is kill it. Said it's still breathing, but said it can't live. It's gangrene and everything done set in it. Said it's dying. Kill it. And then just take the little ones and kill them. They were trying to nurse their mother. A possum is the only animal besides a kangaroo that has a pocket. It packs its little ones in. Said that's the only decent thing to do is kill it. Then after that mother dies, they'll nurse that curdled milk and die right away, cramping and everything. Said just kill them. I said I can't. I just can't. She said, well, you're a hunter. I said, but I'm not a killer. I said, I, I kill only what I eat. And that's an edible animal. And I just can't kill it somehow. She said, that's right, Brother Branham. She said, but don't let it suffer. She was looking at it right from the humane side. But there was something in me that said, don't kill it. All day long, people come and went. She never moved. Laying there and that leg sticking out like that. And them little ones still nursing at her. And I'd punch her with a stick, and she just couldn't get up. And I, that night we went out. They'd taken me out, Brother Woods and them, to take a little ride. We was riding down the road. Brother Woods said, see that little puppy? And I went back to see it, and the poor little thing, somebody had dumped it out. It was all full of fleas and mange and lice. He said, don't you think we ought to kill it? I said, no, let's save it. Now I took him lice, fleas, and mange and all. Got him in my car, took him home, doctored him up. He wants to live. Sure, we all want to live, don't we? So that night when I come in about 11 o'clock, there lay the old possum. Brother Wood said she'll never move. Said if she'd have moved now when it got dark, if she's going to move. Said she'll never come to. I said, I'm afraid she won't either. All night I couldn't get away from that possum. It haunted me. The next morning, my little girl, very spiritual, nine years old, sees visions, very quite pious little girl, little Rebecca. She went with me to the porch to see where the possum was. There lay the possum, mother possum. Now the little one's trying to nurse. I punched at it. It could just barely move yet. Couldn't open its eyes. I went back and sat down in my room. Rebecca went back into the kitchen. I was rubbing my head. I said, oh, my, I wish I could forget that. I guess I'll have to kill it. I don't want to do that. And something said to me, now you was preaching about her yesterday. You said she was a real mother. And you respected her because that she was a mother. She's dying. And if she dies, her babies die. And yet she wants to live for her babies. And you were preaching about her being a real mother, and I sent her to your steps to be prayed for. And she's laid there 24 hours like a lady waiting for her turn to be prayed for. I said, well, why? I said, oh, here, wait a minute, I'm not answering myself. Who was that said that? I thought, oh my, it must be the Holy Spirit. And I turned and went out there. And I said, Heavenly Father, I've seen him do such things before. To an old hound dog once, the bull was going to kill me, the hornets, oh, many things. God deals with animals. They ain't got no soul, but they follow instinct. I thought, Lord, if you got respect for a mother possum who would die, ignorant possum, she wants to raise her babies. And you sent her from the woods up a past some other houses with no fence and turned her in here and laid at my steps for 24 hours waiting to be prayed for. God, if the Holy Spirit recognizes the gift of God, which He's done it by humans thousands of times, but to an ignorant possum, I said, God, then heal the possum. I'll have to meet you at the judgment. The old possum, when I asked in Jesus' name for her healing, she turned over, looked at me, gathered up her little ones, and looked at me as if to say, Thank you, sir. 
That leg just as normal as she could be strutted right down the... Like I said, come here, Becky. Look going there. Right down to the gate, off down the road, just as happy as she could be with her babies going to the woods. Well, that possum knows more about God than a tenth of the people in the world. Led by inspiration. The same Holy Spirit's led you here tonight. Don't you believe me? Have faith. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, led by the Spirit of God. Oh, be merciful tonight, Heavenly Father, as this waiting group, many aged people and sick people are sitting here waiting. And I have to meet them at the judgment. Perhaps if I turn back here a year, if I live, many of a group this size will be gone. I'll never see them no more after tonight. And I pray, God, that you'll be merciful. Save the lost tonight. May they realize that this is the day of visitation. You're here. You're trying to get the people to look to you. Lord, thou knowest that we're trying to get them to look to you. May the sinner be saved just now. If there is a sinner in the building or inside or out that want to be remembered in prayer, if God can make the cripple walk and the blind to see, raise up your hand and say, Brother Brandon, pray for me. Just raise your hand up and put it back down. God bless you, sister. God bless you, sister. Someone else. God bless you. You. Somebody to my right. God bless you. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. That's it. God sees your hand. He's here. He knows all about it. Father, I pray that in Jesus' name that you will save those hands of the people. Granted, Lord, many didn't even have courage to raise your hand, but I pray, Father, that you'll save them anyhow. And may you come with great power just now. And may we be able to say when the service is overnight, like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us? You did something kind of strange, different from what regular ministers done. You took bread in the way you blessed it and the miracle that you performed. Then the disciples knew that it couldn't be a man, it was you. And they went back rejoicing, saying our hearts burn within us. Won't you once more tonight, God? Do something a little different from what regular ministers do. That this audience might know that you've risen from the dead. And you're here leading them tonight to the fountains of life. Speak, O Lord, thy servants will listen. Anoint your unprofitable servant now, Lord. I commit myself to you for the service following in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. You've been very kind and patient. I want to ask you one more thing. We'll bring the platform, the people on the platform for prayer. I want everyone to be just as reverent as you can. This may seem just a little strange to you. If it is, it's all right. Now, if you're critical, I wouldn't stay around. It's a dangerous thing. For be it known, if God comes and diseases go out of people, remember, wish we had time to talk it over, you'll just have to take my word, not my word, but the Bible. They are demons. They can go from one to another. And do, did do it in the Bible and do it yet today. I've seen 25 people struck with epilepsy not long ago. A minister from a certain church sat in a uh, auditorium, him and his congregation. And I asked him to bow their head. He wouldn't do it. I started to pray and something struck me. I looked back. I said, sir, bow your head. He said, I don't have to. I said, very well. I had an epileptic child. I couldn't get the spasm to leave the child. 
had a clothespin with a rag wrapped around it and gnawing his tongue. And I couldn't get the spasms to leave the child. I said, Sir, don't be irreverent. Jesus said, If you can get the people to believe. And I said, You show by your works you don't believe. He said, I don't believe in it. I don't have to keep my head down. I said, Very well. I said, God, would you let this innocent baby suffer for the sin of that man in that group? I said, Satan, come out of the child. You're at leisure. And 25 people jumped in the middle of the floor, running around and around for all things like that. This minister with them, and every one of them had epilepsy. See? That's right. Hundreds of times I've seen it happen with all kinds of diseases. We're not playing. You're in the presence of Almighty God. Now, I don't know you. I only know a few people, and that's t- t- very few. That's two or three sitting here on the front, as far as I know. And this elderly lady sitting right here, Mrs. Spencer, I know her, and the lady and about, down on the front seat right there is about the only ones that I know. I want to ask you something, though. When Jesus was here on earth, how did he say he'd done these miracles? Listen. If you want to go home and read it, read St. John 5, the whole chapter if you want to. But 5.19, when Jesus was questioned about it, when he passed by the lame halt and withered at the pool of Bethesda, well, why didn't he heal them all? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. See, all prophets, and Christ himself only did as the Father God showed them by visions. And if he's the same today, won't he do the same today? Do you believe that if Jesus will return here to the platform tonight and perform and do the same thing that he did when he was here on earth, will you accept it and believe it with all your heart? If you will, raise your hand, dream, no matter who you are, sinner, saint, whatever. God bless you. May he grant it. Remember, when I meet you at the judgment, I'll still have the same testimony by the same Bible, the same God. Now, I cannot heal anyone. You know that. I'm not a healer. I am a minister of the gospel. I see visions. That's a prophet gift. I was born here in the state of Kentucky with that since a baby. Them things just don't come to you. You don't learn them in school. They're divine gifts. Who It's given. The Bible said gifts and callings are without repentance. You're born in this world with those things. They're not come by education or by different things, but by the gift of God. woman before me. Who would like to take my place? Here's, I don't know, perhaps thousand people standing around here close to the guests, several hundred. I'm not a good judge of crowds. Doesn't make any difference to the Holy Spirit or I. Whether it is a dozen or I've preached uh, half a million at a time, 500,000. Many times there are meetings run to 10, 20, and 30, and 40, and 50,000 at a time. We're expecting 80,000 the first night this week in Germany. They love him. They love him. They're war beaten. They're down. In the spite of all the communists and Hitlers and everything else, the gospel still waves on through Germany and all the rest of the country. It's an undying light. It'll never die. Here's a lady standing before me. I've never seen her in my life. We're strangers, I suppose, to each other. But we're not strangers to God. Now the woman stands here, and i never seen her in my life, and she never seen me. But what if this was the same case like Jesus of Nazareth? What if he was standing here? What would he do? Let's find out in the Bible what he would do. He met a woman one time at the well, and he went to talking to her, did he? What was he doing? You say, I don't know. Well, if you were standing here... With this around like I feel now, you'd know what it was meaning. He was contacting her soul. That woman is a living. Every person in here is a spirit and a soul. I'm not dealing with your body. It's your spirit. You get that right. The body will obey it. See? It's the woman's soul that I must touch. Then God, through prophecy, could reveal to me and tell me where she come from. 
who she is and what she is. She didn't know whether that was the truth or not. I don't know her. i never seen her. No way for me to know her. But then he then he would tell her what she's here for. And he could tell her what her outcome was going to be. And if she if he could tell her what her what her has been, she know where that's true or not, surely she could believe what he said would come to pass. Is that right? Wow. Nothing could do it but supernatural. That'll be up to her to believe what it is. Way she way she treats it, that'll determine her destination, what she gets. Now, how many here I want to ask you? Does anybody here know the woman? Raise your hand. Does anybody know her? Yes. Look, well, my, she must be from here, all right? Now, you know her? I don't. You be the judge. Let God be the judge. I don't know her. But if God will, like he did through Jesus Christ, his son, when God the Spirit dwelled in Christ, and Christ said that this same Spirit will come upon you and you'll do the same thing after I'm risen from the dead, I'll be with you to the end of the world. Will you, could, couldn't you believe that? Now, now for the glory of God and for the power of his resurrection, I take every spirit here under my control in the name of Jesus Christ. So do as he tells you. I want to talk to you, lady. I don't mean to make you a, a, a gazing stop. I only do it because I, I have to speak to you. You're the first patient until the Spirit begins to anoint. And then it begins to get different. Then it goes around. See, it takes me under anointing. You're, you are conscious that you're in the presence of something besides your brother. A feeling of knowing that there's something near you. You are a Christian. I see that your Christian is turning real light around you. That means that your spirit is a welcoming. You're not a critic. You come for help. I don't know you. But something is near you. That very thing that you feel, that real sweet, humble, light spirit. Is that true? Raise your hand to your friends if that's true. Can't you see that people between me and the woman? That light moving, whipping around. That's the Holy Spirit. You're, you don't see it perhaps yourself, but your spirit lets you know it's there. Now that's the thing that heals you. Not me. It's your faith in Him. But you come to me to be prayed for, and I don't know where your trouble is, but He can tell me. And if he will tell me, will you accept it and believe it's him? Your trouble lays in your back. It's your kidneys. Is that true? And you're real extremely nervous. And you have a kidney trouble. It's a, it's a poisoning. Through the test shows that it's poison. I see him as he's testing it. That is true. You believe? I never seen her. Now, more I talk to her, more he would say. But look, standing there in that room, look out there, so many to be prayed for. Let watch this a minute. You just speak to me again, sister. Now, I see that voice you heard a few moments ago when it was telling you what was wrong. I don't even know what it was. The only way I know these men's got recorders going here. That wasn't me. That was him. I didn't know what I was saying. It was him talking. But I see a little sign. Uh, no, you're not from Camelsville. You're from a place called Jacktown or something like that. Jacktown, Kentucky. This true, isn't it? Yes, sir. And your first name is Nettie. Right. And your last name is Kaufman. Right. Go back home, Mrs. Kaufman. Jesus Christ makes you well. Your faith heals you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe? If you can believe, you can be healed. Just have faith. It's all you need. 
You want to get over that throat trouble sitting right back there towards the post? You believe that God would make you well? If you believe it, you can receive it. You can have it. God bless you, sister. Stand up to your feet just a moment. Don't weep. Your throat trouble is finished. You don't have to have a prayer card, you see. You have to have faith. That's not me. That's him who looked in the audience and said, where a woman touched his garment. And he said, who touched me? He said, don't ask such questions to everybody. Everybody denied touching. He looked around until he found the woman. He said, I got weak virtue went out of me. That's the same thing taking place. Not me as him, but it's him in here. He said, thy faith has healed thee. The woman knows that's true. Be reverent and believe God. You can have anything that you ask for if you can believe. But you must believe. This is the lady. How do you do, lady? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Son of God? Do you believe me to be his prophet? I say this not for self-respect, sister. It's because the angel Lord said to me, if you'll get the people to believe you. I see a shed of darkness hanging around the woman at death. You, yes. You don't come from this country. You're from a city, a big city. It sits on a hill near a river. And there's a, 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 a city across the other side. Or oh, Cincinnati, Ohio is where you're from. I see the bridge. Mm-hmm. You have a bowel trouble. Yes, That's right. And there's on the liver, mm-hmm. cancer oh. on the liver. That's what the doctor said. And you're, yes, that strong looking doctor that was examining you. Yes, That's, that's right. What he said. So that wasn't it. <laughs> yes. I'm not reading your mind. I know it's yeah. <laughs> You want to go home well? Sure, Except my Lord Jesus. I got lots of more work to do. Sister, Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Mm-hmm. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Mm-hmm. Do you believe I am a believer? I sure I do. Do you believe that that was God speaking through human lips? Yes. Then that anointing is on me. Mm-hmm. What will happen if I lay hands on you? Jesus mm-hmm. said they would get well. Yes. Will you go home rejoicing, giving him praise? (laughs) Then in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I condemn all the diseases of this lovely little mother. Send her wherever she belongs to her home to be well. In Jesus Christ's name, I do this. Amen. God bless you. Yes, I want you to believe that too. And she will recover. God bless you. God bless you. Have faith in God. Jesus said, have faith in God. If you can, you can be made well. How do you do, sir? We are strangers to each other, are we, sir? sir. We've never met in life. No, sir. We were... Just our first time meeting. But the Lord Jesus has fed us all the food that we've ever eaten. He's given us the breath we breathe. And he's the only one who holds our eternal destination in his hand. Being a stranger before you. Well, then, I know nothing of you. But Jesus knows about you. He knows you before you were born. He knows you all your life. Now, he's able, if he will... Tell me what you're standing here for. And if he will, whatever it is, let it be what it may be. Will you believe him with all your heart and accept it to be him? Yes. You will. I will. Yes, sir. You are from Campbellsville because I see you walking on the street, but you're smothering or something. Oh, it's your heart. You have heart trouble. This was caused by a heart attack you had. And you've never gotten over it. Whatever that was was said was the truth, was it, sir? You believe that he's, you're in his presence? I sure do. I lay my hands upon thee, my beloved brother, and ask that God in heaven will give to you the desire of your heart, and you may go tonight and have what you come for. 
for I stand in the light of Calvary to pronounce these blessings in the one who died there for them, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Go, don't doubt him nothing. You shall receive what you ask for. Oh, how I love him. He's the adorable Lord Jesus, precious one. How do you do, young lady? I suppose we're strangers to each other also. I'm so glad to see you. I like to see women without that artificial makeup stuff on. You look like a lady. I'm so happy to see you. God grant to you your desire. I am a stranger to you. But you love the Lord with all your heart. And do you believe him to be the Son of God, which I shouldn't ask you, you do for your Christian believer? And me being a stranger to you, but yet I am his servant. You believe that, don't you? Then I can help you by praying for you. I don't want you to think of what's wrong with you or what you're here for. I want you to think of something else so you see it's not mental telepathy. Mental telepathy is to take a number and they guess at it or something. Keep your mind off of your troubles, every one of you. But you have a little growth, don't you? It's called a cyst, the doctor says. And it's located under your right arm. It's true, isn't it? Your husband is with you, isn't he? I feel his spirit calling now. He needs help also, doesn't he? He's got heart trouble. That's right, isn't it? You may go home. Be well, sister. Lay your hands on your husband while that anointing is on you as it is. God grant to you the desire of your heart as I bless thee, my Christian sister, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have faith in God. Believe Him with all your heart. And you can receive what you ask for. It's your faith that does it. Not me. It's the lovely one who's here tonight. The one I spoke of today that sat with unwashed feet. He loves you so much. Don't turn him away. Accept him in your heart. Oh, what a sin it would be for you to go away from here tonight disbelieving after he's come from glory to do these things. Be merciful. God, be merciful. Now, look this away just a moment, sister. I am a stranger to you, I suppose. We are my many years apart in age. You're a young woman. I know nothing of you, but God knows all about you, doesn't he? If God will let me, his servant, know what you're here for, would you accept it? Friends, I just such a faith pulling from the audience. Honest, I can't hardly see the audience. It's such a faith of pulling, faith arising. I see a vision, a child, right back here. Is there a child laying down there? Got a rupture, has it? Isn't that right, lady? You believe him? The child is hid, but not from God. He knows right where it's at. Do you believe, Mother? Lay your hand over on your child, you and Dad, there, and ask God, Father, be merciful. Will you do it? Grant that no harm comes, but that Jesus, the lovely one, will heal the child. For the glory of God. Amen. I'm not beside myself, no. But such a feeling to know that now, right here stands Jesus, the one who raised from the dead, the one who loves you so much. He's speaking for me now. I've been preaching about him. He's talking now, and that's him. Excuse me, lady, I didn't mean to leave you. I have to follow the way the Spirit leads.
Now, here's a dark streak coming from a woman to another one. What is it? It's a devil. He knows his time has come. This woman here has... You're extremely nervous, aren't you, lady? Just hysterically nervous. I see you trying to do things and you just can't... You're just nervous, mental nervous. Satan told you that you were going to lose your mind if you didn't get over it. But he lied to you. That little lady sitting right there, second one in right back there, she's bothered with nervousness too. Isn't that right, lady? See what I mean? This demon knows if that woman will halfway believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God and I'm his prophet, that'll have to leave her. And that demon was calling to that one for help, for help to accumulate unbelief. But he's lost the battle. Sure he has. Faith is gathering. Very nervous, upset. You're bothered about somebody else, too. That's a man. That man's a soldier, been a soldier. He's a veteran of the war. It's a mental trouble. It is your, it's your husband's brother, your brother-in-law. Your husband has a habit, too, that he ought to quit smoking. Don't fear, sister. Have faith in God. Come here for the blessing. I lay my hands upon this, my sister. Satan, you evil, selfish, ungodly spirit, I challenge you in the name of Jesus Christ in a duel of faith. You're exposed. Come out of the woman. In Jesus' name. Go in peace, my daughter, and may God be with you and bless you. Blood is dropping between me and the lady. She has diabetes. Insulin is a great thing, but oh, the blood of Jesus is so much greater. Let you and I go to Calvary for a transfusion. Will you go with me? Oh, God, I lift this woman to Thee, up to Thy throne, there at Calvary. Will you touch her body just now and make her well? May she not die, but may this be rebuked. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. God bless you, my sister. May His Spirit be upon you. Now that would put you in a bed pretty soon and make you cripple, walk you around on a cane, that arthritis. But Jesus is here to make you well. Do you believe it, sister? Little lady looking around behind that boy, you're suffering with a nervous condition, aren't you? Oh, Satan thought he would hide that. That lady sitting next to you is suffering with a nervous condition, too. Isn't that right? You two ladies put your hands on each other. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Satan, demon, deceiver, you're not going to be able to hold them. They believe. They've touched him. Come out. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a moment. Oh, there you are. Little lady sitting there. Had nervous too, didn't you, lady? I seen a black streak go up. Jesus healed you. Next to you there, you had a lot of trouble. TB. Retarded. You love Jesus with all your heart? You believe Jesus make you well? Then God bless you. 
go and be healed. So can you, sister. Don't disbelieve. Just go. You won't me to put hands on you. In Jesus' name, I do this for the confirmation of faith. Amen. Have faith in God. Come, lady. I see a table standing between me and you. You're going away from it. You're refusing food. You believe he'll make you well so you can live and eat and get over this stomach trouble? Got a lady's condition too, female trouble. Been a long time, but God go to make you well. You believe it? Then I lay hands upon you for your healing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have faith. Go, I believe, this way, if you will. All right, would you come? Now that you might know, friends, I am not reading the people's minds. God bless your heart. That's right. There's no need of trying to hide it now. Your faith has made you a whole sister, dear. You've had a throat trouble, haven't you? Sitting there with your hands just weeping. When I caught you looking this away, something struck you, didn't it? Something said you're healed. The little lady sitting there weeping next to you, she's been having a trouble also, a heart trouble. You believe that Jesus is going to make you whole too? You all put your hands on each other. Lord Jesus, I pray you heal for your glory. You touch, they touched you. I felt them. Now you make them well. Will you, Father? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lady, patient, take a hold of my hand. I am a stranger to you, am I not? If God will show me looking this away, what is your trouble? Will you accept it? Then you won't have to have your operation. The tumor will go right out of you. <laughs> Believe. Have faith in God. You'd never go blind if you could believe with all your heart. You do? Then I lay my hands up on you in the name of Jesus Christ that you be made well. Amen. Have faith, believe with all your heart, and be well. Nervousness is nothing for God to heal, is it? He's done made so many well. You believe you're going to get over it? See, it's the prostrate trouble that causes this. <laughs> Makes you nervous, getting up at nights and everything. That is right. Now go believing, don't doubt at all. It'll stop on you. You'll be well. God bless you, my brother. This I do in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have faith. Don't doubt. I can't heal you, lady, in the little wheelchair. I can't make you well, but I know where your trouble is. If you only believe you're weeping, something's telling you that you can be well. You believe your back trouble is gone? You do? Well, you may go then, and God bless you. You got arthritis. Very bad. Just keep having faith. If you just use a little more faith, you can pick your wheelchair up and go home. Just believe. Have faith. How wonderful is our Lord Jesus. I can hardly see the audience no more. It seems like that everything's becoming milky, white. The Holy Spirit gathering in. People are believing now. 
Why didn't you do that in the beginning? You'd see great things done. How do you do, sir? Oh, asthma's a bad thing. But God's a healer of asthma. You believe Him? Then go believing Him, and it'll cease on you. I bless thee, my brother, in Jesus Christ's name, for your healing. Amen. Go believing now. You can have what you ask for. God be with you. Oh, my. God wants to make you all well. I can't see you no more. God can heal kidney trouble, make people well with their back. Do you believe it? Is it all right in your case you believe with all your heart? You believe that God will make you well? Then I bless thee, my brother, and ask that God heal you Amen. through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. May he make you well. Amen. Amen. Have faith. Real nervous. And it causes you to have a heart trouble like. In other words, a fluttering. Especially when you eat and lay down. You get a smothering. Now I want to tell you, you got a nervous heart, but not a heart trouble. See, it's the gas that forms in your stomach from a nervous, a peptic condition that throws gas up around your heart and makes it flutter. You believe you're going to be well? You believe you're standing in His presence? The Lord Jesus? Jesus? Poor little mother. God bless you, sister, little frail-looking thing. He loves you. He wants you to believe on Him just now. Oh, God. Poor little thing, trying to accumulate enough faith to be made well. Oh, Satan, you cruel thing. I adjure thee in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Leave the woman. Come out of her. My sister, I, I'm just a man. But the blackness was around you is gone. It's light now. Go believing. All will be well. Heart troubles and things is so easy for God to heal. Don't you believe that? It's number one enemy. Kills more people than anything else. But God could heal it. You believe it? You got many suffering out there with it too. How many wants to be healed of it? Now raise up your hands way out in the audience. See, this no way of me knowing. Just so... I'm just about gone. I, I pray that God make you well. Lord Jesus, I bless this woman who wants to live. And I ask that she lives, Lord. And may the enemy leave my sister. May she go to her home tonight and be well. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer of faith shall save the sick. And God shall raise them up. All that you come. My brother, knowing that life is very short for you, unless something can happen, you have cancer, blackness gathering over you. The devil knows that if you can just use a little faith, he's whipped. Won't you believe him, my brother? Have... Will you serve God all your life? Almighty God, I condemn the devil and ask that my brother lives. And Satan, you're exposed. Come out of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't doubt now. Go believing. You can have what you ask for if you believe. Hmm? You believe? 
with all your heart. You believe me to be his servant, sister. Don't be excited. You're just a little nervous. But it's not in my presence. It's him that you can tell. You want to get over your stomach trouble? You'll believe that God sent me to pray for you? If I'll ask him, will you go on eat, believe? Would you come near? Father, with bowed heads and bowed hearts, Satan has robbed this poor woman, seeing a, her life hasn't been a flower bed of ease, a dark string following her. Oh, you demon. I bring her to Calvary. In the name of Jesus, you're defeated. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they'll get well. You'll have to leave her. Come out. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you go. The life that was eating and making the ulcer that caused the burning and going on, it's gone now. You get well. You believe me? Everybody? Has God finally come to your heart? Amen. I know I have to go there pushing my sides. And I, I must. God bless you. I've told you the truth. God's testified that I told you the truth. Now, do you believe God? Then do as I tell you. You'll see the glory of God. Each one of you lay your hands over on each other as believers. Amen. Someone, little boy, little boy with a red shirt on here. Come around here just a minute. Lay your hands on the lady with the wheelchair there. Put your hands over on her. That's it. Right there, honey. Right there. Put your hands over on the lady. Oh, God. This poor mother with her hat on. Long time you've laid like that, brother. You in the wheelchair. Just move a little farther, won't you? You're sitting there with the cancer. Got to die. God will you. Have faith. Let us bow our heads. They shall lay their hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Saith the Lord. Don't disbelieve now, have faith. Each one of you pray this prayer as I repeat it. You say it. Heavenly Father, I come to Thee in the name of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus. I'm unworthy of the healing, but I am taught that Jesus died that I may have it. And I now believe it. And I accept it. And I shall act my faith. And I will go from here tonight believing I'm healed, testifying I'm healed, and defeating the enemy on every corner, believing that you'll confirm your word in me. Through Jesus' name. Now, that's your prayer. Keep your head back. That's your confession. Keep with God. Now, I'll pray for you. And cast away by the Spirit of God all this gloomy doubt, superstition. Oh, dear God, I know I'm unworthy. And I'm weak. My strength is gone. 
But dear God, Thou art strong. And I know that I'm unworthy, but You're worthy. Amen. And it isn't me after all. And I'm so vile. But in the light of Calvary, I'm perfect. Amen. Jesus made me that way by His grace. Now I pray in the perfect manner to you, my Father. I come in His name because He bid me come. And I bring this audience into your presence. Amen. Each one of them. Look at them, Lord. Poor suffering humanity, crippled, sitting in wheelchairs. Little children with their hands on mama. Oh, God. Dad with his hand on mother. Husband with his hand on his wife. Children with their hands on their parents. If this breaks my heart, what does it do to you, Lord? I pray for them. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Look at them, Lord. Look at them. They believe. Satan. You evil spirit, you're defeated. Come out of them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I cast you away. Leave this building. You are defeated, and these people shall be well. Come out. I adjure thee by Jesus, the Son of God. 